Welcome back to another Space News Roundup. We have lots of big updates to cover once again, with the ever-impressive rate of progress with SpaceX's Starship program, the successful launch of Crew-8 to the International Space Station, Artemis 2's SLS rocket is fully mated and has its engines installed, while Artemis 5's engines are put through another rigorous test, China completes another spacewalk on its Shenzhou 17 mission, and we got our first views from the Odysseus lander on the surface of the moon. All of this and so much more, let's kick things off with Starship. Full stack is back, baby. <laughs> That's right, last Monday things were looking a bit bleak with regards to progress towards Starship Flight 3, with the D-stack of Ship 28 and complete rollback to the Mega Bay for Booster 10. But we've seen quite the turnaround of events, with SpaceX demonstrating an absolutely insane rate of propellant loading earlier today. But first, what events took place in the lead up to this? As I already mentioned, the week began with Booster 10 in the Mega Bay and Ship 28 on the suborbital test stand. Once Ship 28 was unhooked from the crane, we saw testing begin with the familiar icing on the vehicle's fuel tank start forming on Monday, indicating cryogenic propellant loading. This was then followed by a small spin prime test, which is basically a bit like a static fire test without the fire. The engine is spun up, but then there's no ignition. Following this, we saw the ice start disappearing as the ship was detanked. And that was that. Prior to this testing, we also saw the arrival of several new water storage tanks to the tank farm, and we also saw the removal of Ship 29 from Mega Bay 2, where it was then moved to the high bay. Things were then a bit quiet at Starbase for a while until we got to Wednesday, when Booster 10 made a return. It was rolled out of Mega Bay 1 under the cover of darkness and transported down to the launch pad. It was then manoeuvred into the arms of the chopsticks, indicating an imminent relift into the launch ring. Meanwhile, similar things were happening with Ship 28. SpaceX's LR11000 crane rose into action with the Starship two-point lifting rig, which was then attached to Ship 28. We then saw the near simultaneous lifting of both Booster 10 and Ship 28, captured really well in this single shot from NASA Spaceflight Starbase Live. First, we see Booster 10 lifted up, swung across the launch ring, and then lowered down. And then, not long at all after, Ship 28 was lifted off the suborbital pad and placed onto a transporter. Following this, it was moved the short distance to the launch tower, where it was then moved to the chopsticks. It wouldn't be lifted for a full stack though until the next day, Friday the 1st of March. Here's a time lapse of the lift taking place during fairly misty conditions and uh, wait a second, what's that? <laughs> yep, there's another Starship at the launch area now. This is Ship 29, which was rolled to the launch site while Ship 28 was waiting to be lifted. It was then placed at the suborbital launch pad temporarily. Anyway, got a little bit sidetracked there. After Ship 29's move, Ship 28 was of course lifted and placed on top of Booster 10, completing another full stack of the Flight 3 rocket. Curiously though, after this was completed, Ship 29 was moved away from the suborbital pad and placed right next to the full stack. I'm not really sure why this was done, but it was most likely just for a photo opportunity or something, a bit like that time we saw a Cybertruck towing a vacuum raptor around the place, since it wasn't hot swapped with Ship 28 or anything, and in fact was rolled back to the suborbital pad shortly afterward. But anyway, with Ship 28 and Booster 10 fully stacked, testing could finally begin. The ship quick disconnect arm was swung into place, and the work platform was extended to allow technicians access to the ship's QD panel, most likely to remove its protective port covers. Not long after, the workers departed and the platform was retracted, at which point the ship quick disconnect extended forward and connected to Ship 28. Booster 10 was also connected to its quick disconnect interface, and then a retraction test was conducted, both for Ship 28 and then for Booster 10. The QD interface is then reconnected, and then we finally got to where I opened this segment of the video, full stack cryo loading. And the frost formed very quickly, meaning that SpaceX was loading the vehicles up at a very rapid pace. We saw the roughly 5,000 tons of fuel it takes to fill the vehicle loaded up in just 45 minutes, which averages to almost 2 tons per second, which is a real testament to the extensive upgrades to the tank farm that SpaceX have made over the past several months. 
This wasn't just a cryo-loading exercise though, this was of course the wet dress rehearsal. Basically, SpaceX would run every step in the launch sequence, aside from actually launching, to ensure all systems with the ship and ground support equipment are working. This is a major step towards launch license acquisition, and of course, Orbital Launch Attempt 3! <laughs> Speaking of Orbital Launch Attempts, SpaceX released an official statement into their investigation into the mishaps of Launch Attempt 2. They noted that the flight marked several significant achievements for the Starship program, with full duration burn of the Super Heavy. However, during boost back, a so-called energetic engine failure led to the rapid unscheduled disassembly of the Super Heavy, and the cause of this was determined to be a filter blockage in the oxidizer turbo pumps, which shouldn't happen for Flight 3 thanks to operational and hardware improvements that SpaceX had implemented for Booster 10. Meanwhile, their explanation for the loss of Ship 25 was that a planned event of excess liquid oxygen propellant led to a combustion event and subsequent fire in the Starship aft section, causing loss of communication with the flight computer and therefore triggering of the flight termination system. Again, SpaceX have implemented improvements in the Starship to mitigate against such an outcome for Flight 3. And now, we wait. Hopefully a launch license will be issued within the next few days, fingers crossed. The crazy Starship progress made by SpaceX didn't slow their Falcon 9's flight cadence. I have a few launches to discuss today, including what I think was the most significant orbital launch of last week, the Falcon 9 launch that took place earlier today. UTC. Local time it was yesterday. <laughs> this was NASA's SpaceX Crew 8 mission, which, as the name suggests, is the eighth crew rotation mission for Crew Dragon to the International Space Station. On board were NASA astronauts Matthew Dominic, Michael Barrett and Jeanette Epps, and Roscosmos cosmonaut Alexander Grebenkin. The rocket lifted off the pad from Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center, and the Dragon is now en route to the station. Although who knows, by the time you're watching this, they may already have arrived. The members of Crew 8 are expected to land back on Earth later this year, in August, and the Falcon 9's first stage is of course already back with us, having performed a boost back burn after stage separation, successfully returning to Landing Zone 1 at Cape Canaveral. In a nod to the crazy cadence of Falcon 9, this isn't the only launch SpaceX have planned for today. While of course subject to things like weather and all that, if all goes without a hitch then we should be seeing the launch of Starlink Mission 6-41 from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral, 6 minutes before midnight universal time. I'll be sure to cover this one in next Monday's episode, so hey, make sure you're subscribed so that you don't miss that episode, and also if you are enjoying the video so far then leaving a like down below is a great free way to help support what I do here. But wait, there's more! Also, also today is another Falcon 9 launch. In fact, the rocket's just gone vertical at the Vandenberg Space Launch Complex. This is SpaceX's Transporter 10 mission, their 10th dedicated smallsat rideshare mission to low Earth orbit, which will carry a massive number of small payloads. Among them will be NASA's Alana 57 mission, as well as an in-orbit docking and refueling experiment between the Gluon and Quark satellites built by Atmos Space. There was one other Falcon 9 launch last week which took place on Thursday. This was Starlink Mission 6-40, which saw a Falcon 9 carry 23 Starlink satellites to Shell 6 in low Earth orbit from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral. Curiously, the last Starlink mission from this launch site managed to carry an extra 24th satellite, thanks to SpaceX implementing performance increases on Falcon 9. But I guess these increases haven't been applied to this booster yet, maybe? Or perhaps we're still too early on from the first time SpaceX tried the larger Starlink payload, and we'll start seeing launches carrying a 24th satellite start becoming the norm after the next few missions are completed. Either way, this mission was another success for SpaceX, and the Falcon 9's first stage successfully landed on the drone ship Just Read the Instructions in the Atlantic Ocean, wrapping up its 11th overall flight. NASA's SLS rocket is one of the cornerstones of the Artemis program. We've already seen the spectacular launch of Artemis 1, and we await the launches of Artemis 2 and 3. The SLS rocket for these flights will be largely unchanged for each mission, but Artemis 4 will see the debut of the Exploration Upper Stage, which is under development at NASA's Mishu facility. In this clip released by NASA last week, you can see technicians completing a major portion of a Weld Confidence article for the new SLS Upper Stage which, when complete, will sport four Hydrolox engines and will evolve the rocket into its more powerful Block 1B configuration, which will be able to launch 40% more cargo to the moon than Block 1. 
The SLS rocket will grow even stronger with Artemis V, as this will be the SLS that NASA hopes to implement its new upgraded RS-25 engines. Certification of these continued last week on Thursday, as NASA performed another hot fire test of an upgraded engine at the Stennis Space Center. During the test, operators fired the engine for over 10 minutes, 615 seconds to be exact, exceeding the amount of time the engine will need to fire during an actual rocket launch. This particular test was the eighth of a planned total of 12 to complete certification of the engine. Artemis II will of course use the old RS-25 engines and the SLS rocket for this mission is really coming together. NASA has released new footage of the core stage's construction, which was filmed at the end of last year. The footage shows the moments where the core stage became complete, with all five major elements fully integrated, minus the four engines themselves. Technicians inserted 360 bolts to complete the last joint, and then came the engines. Yes, not long after the previous footage was shot, teams fully installed all four RS-25 engines to the core stage, which will of course fire for eight minutes during the rocket's launch, taking humans further from Earth than ever before on the Orion spacecraft. On Wednesday, NASA and Intuitive Machines provided us with an update on the status of the ill-fated Odysseus moon lander, which, while successfully landing near the Malapert A crater in the lunar South Pole region, it hadn't managed to land completely upright, and now we can see why. This view here shows a broken leg, causing the robot to sit at an angle of about 30 degrees on the lunar surface. It's fair to say that the lander encountered some challenges during descent. It transpired that the onboard computer couldn't process the laser rangefinding data fast enough, instead needing to rely on optical cameras for altitude and velocity calculations. This resulted in the craft descending about three times faster than planned, and with some sideways velocity thrown into the mix, the landing gear couldn't quite handle the impact, and broke on contact with the surface. That being said, Houston was able to make contact via the lander's low-gain antennas, and could establish a data stream. Initially, the amount of data NASA could glean from the lander's instruments was very limited, but once controllers got the hang of how the signals were being sent, the stream of data became much more usable, hence how we managed to get back lots of images from the surface. Eventually though, the sun set, and on the 29th of February, the lander completed a farewell transmission, as lunar night fell and the lander's solar panels were no longer being lit. If and when the lander awakes next sunrise, it's currently in a configuration where it'll phone home if it can, so we may still hear from the little guy yet. We saw a Long March 3B launch from the Zichang Satellite Launch Center in China's Sichuan province last Thursday. On board was a single satellite operated by the China Academy of Space Technology, which will provide internet satellite services once operational in geosynchronous Earth orbit. Uh, not really a whole lot of other information was shared about this payload, unfortunately. <laughs> Another achievement from China's space program was the completion of the Shenzhou-17 Taikonauts' second spacewalk. This took place on Saturday, when, over the course of around eight hours, Commander Hongbo Tang and crewmate Xinlin Jiang worked outside the Wentian laboratory module of China's space station, completing several upkeep tasks, including solar panel maintenance of the Tianhe core module. Laon Aerospace was back in action last week, but only by the skin of its teeth. Somehow, my save file got wiped, and so all the progress I'd made for my exploration mode playthrough for beginners was lost. Not wanting to be set back too far, I decided to live commentary my redemption, getting back to where we were in as few launches as possible, and as fast as possible. All in all, it was a bit stressful, but ultimately, pretty fun. <laughs> Hopefully it sounds like an entertaining video to you, and if it does, well, there's a good chance it's one of the video cards on screen. And now, I have to give a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters and channel members, names on the left there, without whom none of this would be possible. But that's it. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Space This Week, which was your favourite story for me. Has to be the uh, wet dress rehearsal for Flight 3. I can't wait to see Starship take to the skies once again. But that's it. Goodbye.